Hey, it's great to have you with us. We are looking at the book of Daniel and we are doing a deep dive into scripture because uh, we want to wrestle with this. We want to hear from God. We want the Holy Spirit to speak through uh, the words of the Bible, which is what we believe uh, this amazing book is. Uh, you know, more than just a set of facts about God, but God actually speaks to us uh, through this. We've been looking at Daniel because we want to find out how we can engage with culture, how we can follow Jesus in a culture, in a city, uh, which basically basically has a totally different set of priorities and values uh, and things that it wants us to focus on. And if we're following Jesus, we want to keep him in our sights and we want to make sure that we're following him right at the centre of everything. So we are in Daniel chapter 3 today. Daniel chapter 1, we saw that God was doing something new, a whole new hope through this new little group of guys uh, in Babylon of all places. They're in exile uh, in this strange city uh, and God is going to do new stuff there. So a new hope, that was chapter 1. Chapter 2, you'll remember there was the dream of this kingdom, uh, this coming kingdom and a coming king. Uh, and, you know, this coming kingdom and this coming king were basically going to rule over the entire world and the kingdom was going to last forever. And this was Jesus. And Daniel was given that vision of Jesus and he passed it on to the king, which is amazing. And here we are in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, and Daniel isn't there because Daniel is back in Babylon, but we are this time, we're with Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. We're with them out in the province of Babylon. So let's hear what happens. Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. He set it up on the plain of Dura, that's the, the walled plain in the province of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to attend the dedication of the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that the king had set up. Then they stood before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. A herald loudly proclaimed, People of every nation and language, you are commanded when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, you are to fall face down and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, hire, lyre, harp and every kind of music, people of every nation and language fell down and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, uh, let's pause there uh, before we carry on. Nebuchadnezzar uh, has made this huge, massive gold statue. It's kind of like 30 metres high. Uh, it is massive. He's put it on a walled plain, the plain of Jura. That is one way of reading that, but the, uh, pl the plain, it could also be... It's a, it's most likely it's, a, it's, a, it's an open area uh, that's got walls around it. It's a flat ground with a wall around it. Um, and maybe he's got this idea of this statue from the dream that he's just had in chapter 2, except that he's going to make this statue a little bit different because he's going to make it perfect. You know, this statue is completely made of gold. It hasn't got feet of clay. It's not going to be smashed to pieces, or if it is, it's not going to be smashed to pieces anytime soon. Um, and uh, he's stuck it out in the middle of Babylon and he's said, all of life is going to focus around this now and we're all going to worship this. Uh, and everyone is invited to worship this statue. You know, everyone who's important, uh, anyone who's got any social status or civic role or official position, they're all invited uh, to come and see this statue. And, uh, you know, you, you can come and see it, obviously, um, but the aim isn't just to come and see it and admire it. You, you, you can't just stand there and go, oh, yeah, that's a great statue and take some selfies and put them on Facebook. Oh, no, um, you know, you, you, you have to do something more. Uh, you can't just, uh, you know, say this is fantastic and now I'm going to go and do my thing. Uh, you can't just stand there. You have to join in and worship this statue. That's the deal. Uh, you have to celebrate this statue. You have to, you know, celebrate everything that this statue stands for. And this is what worship is. Worship is what we do with our time, our energy, our money, our heart, our devotions, our fantasies, our aspirations, our ambitions, our career. That is worship. If you want to know what you're worshipping, look at your bank balance and look at your diary. And those two things will tell you what you're worshipping, what you're spending your time and your money on. And these guys, they're being told, you have to come along and you have to spend all of your time bowing down uh, to this gold statue. 
we uh, get this massive list of people who are called to worship. You know, there are seven kinds of rulers, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates. There are seven kinds of instrument that are mentioned. Uh, the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the drum, and every kind of music. There's seven kinds uh, of instrument. There are seven times that gold is mentioned in this chapter. Uh, seven, you know, all of this constant seven, seven types of ruler, seven types of instrument, seven times that gold is mentioned, and basically seven is the number of God. You know, seven days of creation uh, is what it, you know, seven days is what it took God to make the world uh, in those opening chapters of Genesis, and Nebuchadnezzar is basically taking the place of God. Uh, he's directing the way that people worship. He's saying this is what worship should look like. You know, this golden image is the thing that should be worshipped. So, what's, what's going on here? What's going on? This is the, first of all, this is the wrong image. That's what we're going to say, first of all. This is the wrong image. I know that throughout most of our translations is the word statue, but the word is actually image, selem in Hebrew. Uh, it's in Aramaic, but it's roughly the same word in Aramaic. It's selem. And Nebuchadnezzar is setting up an image. It's an image that he's setting up. And why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because, basically, the God of the Bible back at the beginning of the Bible, right at the beginning, those first three chapters, he's already set up his image. He's already put his image in place. You know, his image is the representation of God in creation, the represent representation of God over the whole of the universe. Genesis chapter 1, God created man in his image, we read. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. And now here, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, uh-uh, I've got a different image, it's this golden statue. And Nebuchadnezzar is offering basically a different version of what it means to be God. He's painting a different picture, this golden statue, of what it means to be human. He's painting a different picture of what it means to be a ruler. And this is the wrong image. The image of God tells us what it means for us to be human, what it means, you know, who God is and what our relationship to him is, um, and what it means for us to rule and to have dominion over the world. All of that is set out for us at the beginning of the Bible. Uh, and Jesus, when he comes, he says, you know, he absolutely endorses that and celebrates that. And here's Nebuchadnezzar, and he's just set up a completely different version of what it means to be God, what it means to be human, and what it means to be a ruler. It's the wrong image. And when you have the wrong image, when you're worshipping in the wrong place with the wrong thing, you understand the world completely wrong. You know, completely wrong. So there's all these sevens going on in this chapter, uh, and we've, we've read a few of them, all these lists of sevens. Um, but there's also a whole bunch of threes. You know, the list of officials. There's three um, lists of... Uh, the list of officials is mentioned three times. Uh, the list of peoples and nations and languages is mentioned three times. Uh, there's all these threes going on, and against all these threes that are, you know, all the officials that are coming to worship at the wrong image, uh, and all the peoples and nations and languages that are coming to worship at the wrong image, against all of those, there are these three young Jewish men. So the threes continue. The three young Jewish men who are going to, instead of worshipping this image, are going to worship uh, God uh, because they know that they already are made in the image of God. Um, so, Nebuchadnezzar has erected, put in place, this image uh, to be worth, worshipped. Everyone stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, had made to stand. Standing is a theme in Daniel. Uh, sort of like, so this image is made to stand. Chapter 1, uh, three times it was all about who can stand before the king. Chapter 2 of Daniel, uh, six times God causes empires and kingdoms to stand. Uh, chapter 3, nine times Nebuchadnezzar sets up his image and makes it stand. Nine times. Standing is all about, you know, who is in charge, what is actually uh, put at the centre of culture, who is actively directing the course of events, who is standing and serving, who is making stuff happen. And here Nebuchadnezzar obviously thinks that it is him. So it's the wrong image, it's the wrong image, and it's also the wrong temple, it's the wrong kind of worship. 
You know, the wrong image means that we worship the wrong things. Worship, again, is what we do with our time, our affection, our money, our skills, our effort. Uh, and if, you have, if you're focusing in the wrong direction, if you've got the wrong image, a different image of what a human being is, uh, then you're going to end up with the wrong kind of worship. And our culture offers us a, you know, all sorts of options around what it means to be human. But, you know, the Bible offers us a very clear and distinct alternative about what it means to be human and therefore what it means to worship. If you start with the wrong idea about what it means to be human, you end up with the wrong idea about who God is. Who God is and who we are and the relationship's all wrong. Uh, and so, you know, worship ends, off, ends up going off in all sorts of different places. So in our culture, you know, people worship in supermarkets, people worship in shopping malls, people worship on Amazon, people worship with their money and their time. They give their time to all sorts of extraordinary things. And it's not that they're bad things, but they're just not things to worship. They're not things to give all of your life to. And here Nebuchadnezzar has set up this image and there's this counterfeit worship. This counterfeit worship. And this constant rep repetition, you know, this constant repetition here, the constant lists of, uh, of, of, se of senior officials, the constant lists of the nations that are coming, the constant lists of the music, it's kind of like, this is what pagan worship is. This is what any kind of worship is that isn't linked to the God of the Bible. Any worship which is directed in the wrong place, this is what it is. Initially, it can look really exciting. You know, you've got this huge walled area here. You've got thousands of people. You've got a massive gold statue. You've got music. You've got smoke. It's awesome. And then, you know, this constant repetition. It's just like, you know, this is just endless. The habit, the addiction. It's meant to sound ridiculous. It's meant to sound comic. Uh, this whole, you know, this, the way that this text is written is meant to make us laugh and see the ridiculousness of worshipping anything other than the God of the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar has taken the directing of worship onto himself. He's decided that he is going to decide what's going to be worshipped and how it's going to be worshipped. And the state wants to tell us what to worship. You know, our culture, this is what culture does. Culture wants to tell us what to worship. It's part of the nature of culture. It directs us where to use our time, where to use our energy, where to use our money, where to use our skills. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar has done. He's built this big walled plain. He's put this gold image at the center. He's made this courtyard. He's put a, a furnace in the vicinity of it that we're gonna find out that, that people can be thrown into uh, if they won't worship. Um, and, and this should all remind us of something. You know, a big courtyard with something gold at the middle and a big fire outside. Uh, this should remind us again of the temple. This is the place where the God of the Bible was worshipped back in Jerusalem. At the centre was the golden holy of holies, the place where, you know, the spirit of God uh, lived. Outside there's the courtyard and there's an altar with the fire on it where the animals are sacrificed. Uh, and that's, that's how God wanted to be worshipped in Jerusalem. And so what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here is a counterfeit. It's a fraudulent worship. It looks like it could be the wrong thing. It looks like it could deliver the same sorts of results, but it's never going to because it's repetitious, it's endless. You never finish, you never get satisfied. You just keep on going more and more and more and more. If it's not the job of our culture to direct worship, whose job is it? You know, if it's not the job of the state to direct worship, whose job is it? Who should we leave that to? Who's been trusted with worship and with leading everyone in worship? Who's supposed to do that? This is the job which has been given to the people of God in the Bible. Uh, the Bible describes God's people as a kingdom of priests, leading people to worship the one true God, the God of the Bible. That's our role, that's our job. That's why we stand out, that's why we're so distinct, because we're worshipping different things. You know, we're using our time differently. We're using our money differently. We're using our skills differently on different purposes, on the worship of God, on wanting to see him glorified, on wanting to see people loved and know what his character's like, on wanting to see his kingdom grow and people invited into his family. That's how we worship. And it's different to the way that the world worships. And you know, this, th there's a whole lot of music involved in this passage there's a whole lot of worship and and music uh, and it's like they all go together and and music is a, is really fundamental to worship 
I don't know why, I don't know how it works, I don't know why God's made it that way, uh, but you know, singing together with lots of instruments uh, is always an expression of worship. And obviously there are lots of contexts in which people sing together with lots of instruments and lots of production and lots of other stuff. And it's encouraged as worship in scripture. You know, what Nebuchadnezzar describes here is actually, you know, looks really small compared to the amount of resources and instruments and choirs that were provided in the temple in Jerusalem when God was worshipped. And so singing together with lots of instruments and lots of production and lots of, uh, you know, every kind of effect that we can bring to it, that's encouraged as a worship in scripture as a way of the people of God worshipping the one true God and this uh, Nebuchadnezzar's worship is, is, is a sham, it's a, it's a copy, it's an imitation of that. Uh, and priests, you know the priesthood of God, we are priests, you know we, the, the, we, are, we are priests of the, the people of God are the priesthood of God, that means that we lead the way in worship, we point to the place of worship, we worship uh, you know, the one true God, we, 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 we show people to the presence of God. We point to him uh, in the way that we worship. We point to him in the way that he makes a difference in our lives as we come into his presence. So that's the whole thing. This is kind of like, you know, there's an, this image set up and uh, it just says so much about what worship is, so much about what needs to be at the centre of our culture, so much about what needs to be at the centre of our lives uh, at the center of our worship you know what we do with our time our money our skills all of that uh, is so so key so there you are Neb Nebuchadnezzar has set all of that up he set all of that up and here's what happens next this is quite long I'm going to read to the end of the chapter so some Chaldeans took this occasion to come forward and maliciously accuse the Jews they said to King Nebuchadnezzar may the king live forever you as king have issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum and every kind of music must fall down and worship the gold statue. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are some Jews you have appointed to manage the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. These men have ignored you, king. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. Then in a furious rage... Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring in Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar asked them, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? Could this possibly be true? Could this possibly be the case? Now, if you're ready, he says, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue that I've made. But if you don't worship it, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he doesn't rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage. He's getting more and more angry. And the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times more than was usual. And he commanded some of the best soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So these men, in their trousers, robes, head coverings and other clothes, were tied up and thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Since the king's command was so urgent and the furnace extremely hot, the raging flames killed those men who carried Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego up. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, fell bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his advisers, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, look, I see four men not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and called, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego came out of the fire. When the satraps, pre prefects, governors and the king's advisors gathered around, they saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair of their heads was singed. Their robes were unaffected. There was no smell of fire on them. 
Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He sent his angel, his messenger, and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I issue a decree that anyone of any people, nation or language who says anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego will be torn limb from limb and his house be made a garbage dump. For there is no other god who is able to deliver like this. Then the king rewarded Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So... There we go. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego will not join in. They won't join in the worship uh, that is being offered to them. They won't join in the worship of that culture. Just like we shouldn't join in with the worship of our culture. You know, they won't join in the worship of consumerism. They won't join in with the worship of politics. They won't join in with the worship of expressive individualism, of identity politics, whatever it is. They won't put anything at the centre except the worship of the God of the Bible. But how do they do that? What do they do? How do they resist? How do they push back? Well, this is really interesting because they don't protest. They don't protest. You know, they don't speak badly about everything. They don't disrespect what's going on. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't uh, you know, <laughs> write rubbish stuff about it on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. They don't do that. They, they just don't join in. That's all. They just don't join in. And there's a, there's, you know, that says something for us, surely, about just not joining in. This isn't about a protest, it isn't about speaking badly of people, it isn't about going into battle with people on uh, social media, it's just about not joining in with the things that our culture wants us to worship, wants us to put at the centre of human life, says unless you accept this and do this and behave like this, you are not a flourishing human being. Um, you know, that's, that's, we, there's no need to combat, it's just about not joining in. But there is a, sometimes a consequence, and there's a consequence that, does, that sometimes there's no way of avoiding. You know, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they've got away with there not being a consequence up to now, but someone's dobbed them in, basically, uh, and, you know, whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. That is, that is a consequence. And so often, you know, we, I know that me, I want to avoid sometimes the negative consequences of not joining in. Sometimes there's no way to avoid it. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they're respectful, they're generous, they're not combative, they don't take a principled stand about this, they, they don't criticise it, but they just don't join in. And there's still a consequence. There's still a consequence. And Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they're government officials at this point. They've been appointed to oversee the province of Babylon. You know, Daniel is still back in Babylon City. They're out in the province of Babylon and they're government officials. So when they don't join in, they are called to the highest court in the land, uh, which is the king. And the king is going to find them guilty. You know, and when we don't join in, sometimes we will be found guilty. Sometimes we will be judged and found guilty. Sometimes it will be the courts. Sometimes it will be social media. Sometimes it will be our employers. But this should not be any surprise. You know, Nebuchadnezzar says, if you don't worship the golden image, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? The implication is, there is no God in heaven who can get in the way of me doing what I want to do. There is no God in heaven who can get in the way of my values, my beliefs, my, you know, the whole thing that I want to put at the centre of life in Babylon. There is no God in heaven who can stop this happening. It's a big statement. But you know what? It's probably a statement that most people in our culture would be completely happy making. You know, there is no God in heaven who can get in the way of me doing what I want to do. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego's response. This is amazing. So it's completely different. It's a completely different tone. They don't list all of the officials. They don't list all of the instruments. You know, they don't go through all of that palaver of all of the stuff that, and all of, the, all of the endless lists and the, the, the comedy of that. Instead, they're direct and to the point. Uh, you know, they, they say, if the God we ex serve exists, Nebuchadnezzar, then he can rescue us. Or if need be, the God we serve can rescue us. He can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire and he can rescue us from you, the power of the king. Uh, but even if he doesn't rescue us, they say, we want you as king to know that we won't worship your gods 
or worship the golden statue that you have set up. Mic drop. You know, this is not what you say to the king of the biggest empire in the world at the moment. You know, you don't march up to him and say, look, I just need you to know that I'm not going to, you know, I can't do this thing and I can't worship the way that you want me to and I can't put at the centre of everything what you want me to put at the centre. This is awesome. But I love that they do that and I love the way they do it. You know, just so straightforward and so uncomplicated and so un, uh, uh, unaggressive, just like really straightforward and simple. And you know, I love that even if he doesn't rescue us, you know, God might rescue us or he might not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, we may be judged, we may be condemned, we may be thought weird, we may be thought strange, but it doesn't matter. It's so easy for our faithfulness to God to be conditional. Will he do what we want? Will things turn out the way I'd like? Will I get through this in the way that I think is the right way for me to get through this? But these guys, they're like furnace, no furnace. Burnt to death, not burnt to death. We're with God. Either way, that's the most important thing for us. And that's what worship is. You know, sticking with God regardless. Uh, what's Nebuchadnezzar's response? He's filled with rage. He's furious. Of course he is. Of course he is. You know, his central principles have just been refused. You know, his idea of what it means to be human has been countered. You know, you've just said something, you know, you've just said exactly the wrong thing to him. You, you've all, you all know the sorts of conversations that take place on Twitter and Instagram. It's kind of like, that's just happened, uh, you know, here. Nebuchadnezzar is just absolutely furious that someone could say something like this. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. And he goes on to say, but do not fear because I have conquered the world. And we're going to see how that happens. So Nebuchadnezzar is furious and he gives orders for the furnace to be superheated seven times. Notice the sevens again, they keep on piling up in this chapter, uh, you know, because he's acting like God, he's going to superheat this furnace seven times. He gets his best soldiers, his strongest soldiers, literally, mighty men, literally, but men who are good at fighting, and he gets these guys to tie up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and they're bound up, and this is, this is a, he's making a point here. You know, because this isn't just about them dying, they're being tied up, they're being bound like sacrifices because they're going to be offered as sacrifices to Nebuchadnezzar's gods in the fire of the altar. So Nebuchadnezzar wants his gods to be honoured in this. You know, that whole thing about this whole situation being worship, being like a temple with the walls and the gold statue in the middle and then the, the, the fiery furnace, which is, you know, they, they, this is like doing honour. They're being sacrificed to Nebuchadnezzar's gods. Uh, and they keep wearing their clothes, you know, their robes and their turbans and all of that sort of stuff. And this is important. It's important because, the, the, you know, back in, back in that day, it's like you wore clothes that showed what your social role was and what your civic function was. So this is kind of like, you know, they're being burnt with their official clothes, with the uniform of their office. It's like they're being symbolically stripped of their office. And they're being sacrificed to gods, to Nebuchadnezzar's gods. Uh, and they're being stripped of their office at the same time, and uh, quite apart from just being killed in a really nasty way. So what happened? Well, we read it just now. The command of the king was so urgent, and the flames were so hot, that the flames killed those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the mighty men, the best soldiers, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, top team, his SAS team, are killed in this fire. The flames have the power to destroy the servants of Nebuchadnezzar. The flames have the power to destroy the servants of Nebuchadnezzar's gods. You know, they have the power to destroy and they destroy Nebuchadnezzar's top team there. Secondly, the, the three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, notice they fall into the furnace. The word fall, you won't be surprised, occurs how many times? seven times uh, in this chapter, seven times, six times, people fall down before Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. This last time, the three men fall into the furnace. And the suggestion is that this is worship too. Being thrown into the furnace is worship too. Being thrown into the furnace is worship too. You know, it might not feel like worship, you know, when you're judged and when you're criticized and when you're condemned, it might not feel like worship. 
when you go home instead of getting drunk with your friends, when you help out at food bank instead of binge watching something on Netflix, when you're teaching your kids about Jesus, when you're not having a sexual relationship outside of a marriage covenant, you know, when you're judged for that and you're thrown into the furnace for that, it might not feel like worship, but this passage is saying that too can be worship. And of course, they don't get burnt up. You know, the fire that consumes the servants of Babylon You know, judgment and condemnation and criticism would, you know, people are condemned by that and their lives are destroyed by that. But the lives of the servants of God are not destroyed by that because we know, we know uh, that God is in there with us. The soldiers of the state are burnt. The soldiers of God's kingdom don't get burnt up at all. Uh, So they are able to stand in the fire. They stand. All that, that standing is a theme in Daniel and they're able to stand and serve in the fire. They untie the ropes that bind them and restrain them and then they're not there anymore. They retain the clothes of their office. And now there's a question, you know, th- th- these guys are there in, in, in the uh, furnace and they're walking around and they've got the clothes of their office on and they're set free. And, you know, the question is, you know, who would ne- Nebuchadnezzar want to have on his team? You know, when he as a leader has to go through the fire, when he has to go through difficult times, who would he want on his side? Would he want the servants who obeyed him uh, and, you know, threw these guys into the furnace? Or would he want Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego on his side? You know, that's the question. There they are in the furnace and they're standing and they're serving and they're free and they're walking around and someone has joined them in the fire. A fourth person, an angel uh, in your translation, angel, uh, malach, just means messenger basically. Uh, And it's a messenger that looks like a son of the gods or a son of God. A son of God. You know, there's a fourth person who looks like a son of God. This is a title which Nebuchadnezzar would have been very happy using for himself. The kings of Babylon, the kings of Assyria, the kings of Persia, they were happy to call themselves son of God. But this is what a son of God really looks like. It's someone who can go into the fire and come out not burnt. And that's that's Jesus. You know, Jesus goes through the fire of condemnation and judgment uh, and is, is crucified and nailed up on the cross and comes out not burnt at the resurrection. This is Jesus. Nebuchadnezzar. He shouts out to the three men. He says, servants of the Most High God, which is the Gentile way, uh, the pagan way of referring to the God of the Bible, the Most High God. Uh, And uh, essentially he's recognising, he's recognising that the power of the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, you know, in what he's seeing in front of his eyes and can barely believe probably. But the Most High God and his son were allowing their servants not to be destroyed. The Most High God and his son were allowing their servants, you know, not to be consumed and not to be judged and not to be condemned as they carried out their roles in high office, in government, as Christians in Babylon. And the Most High God and his son, you know, they'll pour out the power of the Holy Spirit on every single one of us uh, if we ask him to, if we ask them to. Uh, so that we won't be destroyed and won't be burnt up and won't, be, won't, you know, won't feel the heat of that as we um, try and live out our Christian life in Babylon, in London. Uh, and lo- the fire burns up the wicked. It burns up the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, but it doesn't burn up the righteous. Uh, but by stoking the fire, you know, Nebuchadnezzar has cranked up the heat of this fire seven times. And what he was doing was destroying his own people. He was destroying his own people with false worship. And the end result here is, you know, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't yet turn to Yahweh. He doesn't yet turn to the God of the Bible, but that will come. But he orders that nothing is to be spoken against the God who can do this amazing thing. Nothing is to be spoken against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He says, there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. And that is so true. You know, there, that, is, that is a prophetic truth that Nebuchadnezzar speaks without knowing what it means. There is no other God who can deliver like this. Believe this, church. Hold on to it. You know, stand on those words. There is no, God can bring you through the fire and out the other side without you being burnt. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they're rewarded. 
you know, sometimes, this is the whole thing about living in Babylon. Sometimes people think you're amazing, and then at other times they think you are just, you know, the worst thing ever. Uh, but now they're back in high esteem. They've still got enemies. There are still people who don't like them. The guys who dobbed them in earlier, for example, but for now they're protected. And the implications of this are that it's now completely safe for God's people to worship Yahweh in Babylon. They don't have to assimilate. They don't have to join in. They don't have to fall face down to Nebuchadnezzar's ridiculous statue with the ridiculous music, with the ridiculous lists of officials. You know, God is there with his tiny minority people. And God is with us as his tiny minority people. You know, less than 1% of the population of this part of London, of Tower Hamlets, less than 1% of the population uh, worship God and are attached to the church. And God is with his tiny minority people. He blesses us more than we deserve. We're a tiny minority, not by accident, but because, you know, really God has been doing something. He's been doing something through history. Maybe, you know, we haven't been faithful. Maybe people in the past haven't been faithful. But here we are as a minority who are still persisting with God and God blesses us and he protects us and he wants to look out for us and he's always looking for ways to bring us through. What looks like exile, what looks like persecution, what looks like a blazing furnace, those are all the way that God is going to refine and sharpen and purify his people whether that's in Babylon or whether that's here in London. So three things, three things. First of all, you can go through the fire and not be burnt. You're gonna hear this a lot in scripture. Isaiah says it, it's, it's, it's Psalms say it, Jesus is gonna say it. You can go through the fire and not be burnt. You can do that if you do it with Jesus. You can, you can face criticism, you can face hostility, you can face judgment, you can do that if you do it with Jesus. You can go through the fire and not be burnt. Number two, your times of opposition, your times of judgment, the times of condemnation, those times that you feel like they're the worst thing ever, they can be your best times of worship. You know, they can be the kind of worship that is just unimaginable. These guys, they fall into the furnace and that's an image of worship. And... You know, this is the kind of worship that can only happen now. Falling down, you know, while everyone around you is condemning you and judging you and criticising you and you're in pain and you're hurting and you're upset by it. That will never be able to, that, that can never happen in heaven. You know, when Jesus comes back, there won't be any of that. Worshipping out of that pain is something that we can only do now, that sacrifice of worship on the altar, you know, with the, with the fire going on around us. Uh, again, that's something that we can only do now. Your times of opposition and judgment and condemnation, turn them into worship. Spend time with Jesus. Take them to him. Say, look, I worship you. I love you. I, this is for you. I want you to do something with this. You can go through the fire and not be burned. Your, time, your worst times can be your best times of worship. And lastly, stick together with friends who have Jesus at the centre, even in the fire. Stick together with friends who have Jesus at the centre, even in the fire. You know, we have a spiritual discipline, spiritual practice here at CC Spitz. We encourage people to spend an hour of conversation with a friend every week so that we're talking to people you know, telling people what's going on for us, uh, connecting with people, praying for each other. Uh, join a midweek group, you know, hang out with other people who have Jesus at the centre and keep on doing that even when it's difficult. You know, don't give up, don't, you know, so often I hear people say, oh, I can't do that right now because I've got too much going on or I'm too stressed. Stick with it, you know, that's exactly the time to hang out with people with Jesus at the centre. You can go through the fire, you can not be burnt. Your, your worst times, your most dreadful times can be your best times of worship. And stick together with friends in a midweek group and in one-to-one, -one, uh, people who have Jesus at the centre, even when it's difficult. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you're there in the fire with us. We thank you that, it's the, that you are there with us and we won't be burnt, we won't be consumed, we won't be burnt up. And Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, that you are with us even through the darkest and the most difficult times, even through the times of the most opposition and hostility. But Lord, we thank you that this can be worship. Uh, we thank you that this is life-giving and 
flourishing and we thank you that your kingdom uh, is going to last forever and that you uh, will not forsake us and you will not leave us and that you will bring us safely home to eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.